U.S. cities are just built different than their European counterparts. And that starts with the street network. This is central Rome, Italy. And for comparison's sake, this is central Salt Lake City, USA. These maps are at the same scale. There are some differences. Obviously, Rome's street pattern is more organic, with roads originating in ancient Rome twisting this way and that. Salt Lake's roads are north, south, east, west, and nothing else. It's a grid. You tend to see grids in cities designed from scratch or designed to grow fast like many colonial cities. Cities like Rome that grew up over millennia tend to have an organic pattern. Rome's blocks are smaller. I think 10 Rome blocks could probably fit into one of Salt Lake City's blocks. And those big blocks are 200 meters by 200 meters, by the way. Definitely on the large side, even by US standards. Small blocks are great for people moving on foot because smaller blocks result in high intersection density. Intersections mean choice, and more choice of route is good. It means it's easier to walk from point A to point B directly instead of having to take long, tiring detours. Another big difference is the width of the streets and how they're used. I picked an outlier in Salt Lake City. Its main roads are an incredible 40 meters wide. The story goes that the former governor of Utah Territory proclaimed that the city's streets should be wide enough for a team of oxen and their cart to make a U-turn. You won't see many oxen in Salt Lake City streets today, but that kind of width makes it very convenient for moving cars and not nearly as nice for pedestrians. They're so wide that some people have proposed adding housing to the medians. You can still have room for cars on either side, too. That's an extreme example, but it's not uncommon for U.S. cities to have roadways 25 to 30 meters wide. Meanwhile, some of the narrower streets in Rome are no more than 3 meters wide in places. More commonly, the smaller streets are about 6 meters wide. What about this wide street in Rome right here? It's the Corso Vittorio Emanuele II. This was not a street of ancient origin, but was cut through the city in 1886. It connected the Pope and the Vatican to the Capitoline Hill, the historic seat of power in the Roman Empire, and home to the current city hall. It was also designed to improve traffic circulation throughout the old city. Even with this directive to reduce traffic and the symbolism of the connection it makes, it's still only 20 meters wide, half as wide as Salt Lake streets. What you get in Rome are a few wide streets for cars, but most meant for people. In US cities, it's all cars all the time. Now streets are only one element of a city, and European cities are different than US cities in other ways too, like the sidewalk cafes, charming old buildings, and crowds of clueless tourists. But streets form the structure, the bones of a city's fabric. Getting the street and block structure right is a massive step towards a walkable, livable city. Is it possible for US cities to clone European street networks? Let's be honest, probably not. But we could employ a different strategy. What if we took the large blocks we find in US cities and filled them up with narrow Euro-style streets, only a few meters wide? Sure, you'd still have busy car streets crisscrossing the city, but you'd also have a separate network of pedestrian first streets with a completely different vibe. I know that it sounds crazy, but I think it's possible. I know because I've seen it firsthand. Let's get into it after the bike bell. Philadelphia has its share of narrow streets. One of its many tourist attractions is Elfrith's Alley, America's oldest continuously inhabited street. It dates back to 1703, which makes it practically modern by European history standards, but it's old enough to reflect a European influence. It's also only about three meters wide, about the same width as those streets in Rome but it has a unique American feel, in part thanks to the so-called Trinity houses that line the street. They're narrow, only about five meters wide, and three stories, hence their name. They're found all over historic Philadelphia. Their small size makes them some of the most affordable housing in the central city, sort of a tiny house for an urban context. One old street with tiny buildings doesn't mean much, right? It's so odd and out of context in the modern American city that it's a tourist attraction with its own museum. But, when I visited Philadelphia this spring, I kept stumbling onto these very narrow historic streets. It's that experience that inspired this video. I think that Philadelphia can show us that incorporating European style narrow streets with small blocks and few cars is indeed possible. If you visit Philadelphia and want the Elfris Alley experience, but better, head to Quinn Street instead. It's better because it has the same charm as Elfris with a narrow street and Trinity houses, but it's also part of a network of similar streets. You can think of it as a smaller network within the larger street grid of Philadelphia, which is a much more typical 120 meters by 120 meters. Within that block, there are actually six smaller blocks. The smallest block in the middle only has 11 homes. Excuse me while I switch to using imperial units for a second, but the density of that block is 60 dwelling units per acre, as US planners would say. That would make it some of the most dense housing in all but the largest cities in the US. Here is what that density looks like as an apartment building with a parking lot. The density here is so high because the houses are small and there is no parking. 
This block doesn't have the exact same organic street network pattern you'd see in a place like Rome. There are still right angles. But the small blocks, narrow streets, and lack of a true gridiron gives visitors the feeling of being in an old European city. I love that feeling of being just a little lost and discovering something new around every turn, and being able to do it on foot without ever worrying about cars. In fact, the only downside I experienced while I was there was the fact that that street network wasn't bigger, with more pedestrian streets. Philadelphia's streets are almost the exact same width as the Corso Vittorio in Rome. Imagine if you had a Corso Vittorio every 120 meters. Rome would be way worse. Philadelphia's small pedestrian streets do extend to other blocks, and in the case of Quinn Street, cross over a larger street and keep going. What's interesting is that this stretch of street has modern buildings. They're clearly designed to blend in with their historical counterparts, using brick for the facades and keeping the three-story heights. The modern buildings are not quite as good as the Trinity houses, because they add garages. This means that the narrow streets need to be wide enough to allow cars to access them regularly, something that's not the expectation in the older section. This also makes the homes wider, reducing overall density. I will admit that the roof decks are a nice touch to get some private outdoor space. Despite these design quibbles, the modern homes make it clear that these narrow pedestrian streets don't need to be considered a historic relic that can't be replicated today. Thus far, we've seen how European and US cities are structured differently, and how the US has some rare examples of European-style street networks. But the driving question of this video is, can the US build Euro-style street networks today? What would it take to see more of these blocks in cities all over the US? The first thing we need are locations to build something like this. They make the most sense in central cities, where space is already constrained in a high-density neighborhood like this makes sense. Luckily, most cities are full of locations that could have a block or two like the one in Philadelphia. Parking lots that take up an entire city block are a great first option, like this one here in Sacramento. The streets are even 120 meters apart like Philadelphia. You could just copy and paste. And when you do, the value of that block goes through the roof. Of course, it's not going to be that simple. There are several ways that the Philadelphia block would be illegal to replicate in most US cities, despite it surviving and thriving for literally hundreds of years as a vestige of European-style urbanism. Road width is one of the most obvious road blocks. I can't think of a US city that would allow residential buildings on a street three meters wide. But hey, someone could prove me wrong in the comments. Minimum street width is often regulated by the fire code. The fire marshal needs to be ensured that fire trucks can fit down a street and put out a fire. The National Fire Protection Association says that fire departments need streets of at least six meters wide. This allows for one fire truck to pass another to access fire hydrants and safely move around a building fire. The question is, could the 20 meter wide roads around the block provide sufficient access for fire trucks? Maybe, depending on the size of the block. Building entrances need to be within 15 meters of a road accessible by fire trucks, but that can extend to 46 meters for one and two family dwellings or townhomes if they have automatic sprinkler systems. If you draw a line 46 meters in from the streets along the edge of the block, you can see that they don't quite reach all the way in. It could work in cities with smaller blocks though. Portland, Oregon is well known for its small blocks downtown at just over 60 meters by 60 meters. Lots of cities in the US founded by the Spanish have block sizes of 90 meters, which would just squeak by the fire protection standards. Cities with bigger blocks could also include an access road in the center. Fire departments will also use parking lots as access roads, so a couple of small parking lots could help too. Speaking of parking, there's another challenge for building these types of blocks today. Most cities have parking requirements for new development. Parking requirements are often expressed by the number of spaces per home or the number per bedroom. In urban areas, you may see standards anywhere from a half to one and a half spaces per home. Assuming one space per home, a block like this one in Philly could need a parking lot that would take up a quarter of that space. Luckily, many cities are reducing or eliminating parking minimums, including larger cities like Minneapolis and Buffalo. But you may be asking yourself, where would all of these residents park if there were no spaces available to them? If you look closely, there are some small parking areas tastefully woven into the urban fabric in Philadelphia. It's not impossible to park cars in a block like this. And obviously, newer buildings could have garages built in. And it's not like European cities don't have cars. A quick look at some of Rome's streets reveals cars, Vespas, and little parking lots tucked away. But for plenty of these residents, parking may not be important to them. When a resident of Alfreth's Alley was asked about where they parked their car, he said, but really, if you live in the city, you become more pedestrian friendly and you do public transportation. We do have a car, but it's parked a few blocks away. This makes sense in US downtowns where you don't need to go far to find a parking lot, and many of them aren't as full as they used to be now that we're in a work from home era. Another major roadblock is just zoning itself. You didn't think we could make comparisons between US and European land uses without talking about zoning, did you? Now it's a lot easier to generalize about suburban residential zoning with its monotonous expanses of homes than it is to generalize about US downtowns. 
For this reason, it's going to be hard for me to point to a specific part of a zoning code that would hold this type of development back. For some cities, it's the narrowness of the townhomes. For others, it may be the fact that there are townhomes at all. Townhomes are often referred to as missing middle housing because they provide a density between single-family houses and condo towers, but don't often exist in sufficient quantities. They're attractive because they can provide gentle density at a relatively low price, but zoning codes aren't always written to make it easy to build. But if you had a vacant or underused lot, the correct dimensions for the fire marshal, and the local regulations to allow it, it seems to me that you could build a European-style urbanism within existing U.S. cities. It would be difficult, but welcomed, as we here in the States would love the opportunity to have even a small taste of what you have in places like London, Amsterdam, Rome, and Paris. Those places already have the legal framework, culture, and history to make good urbanism happen. We just want it here too. If this is a topic that really interests you, you might want to learn more about how European cities built European-style urbanism. I have a video on the entire history of Paris that dives into this very topic. You can trace the origins of Paris from the Parisi tribes near the Ile de la Cité and the Seine, all the way to the city's impressive adoption of the bicycle in this decade. The video is one of my absolute favorites, and you can actually check it out right now over on Nebula. It's live there now. Nebula is a creator-owned streaming service that I'm extremely proud to be a part of. On Nebula, you can see all of my extra content, including my Great City series, Planning Ancient Rome, and a whole bunch of smaller bonus video content. But me and all my creator friends have started this new thing called Nebula First. Other creators are doing the same thing, meaning that you can watch videos from Johnny Harris, Legal Eagle, Jetlag, and more earlier than you'd find them on YouTube. Now, Nebula is normally priced at a completely reasonable $50 per year. But if you use my code CityBeautiful when you sign in, you get $20 off that annual plan. That brings it down to $250 a month which is really the best deal in streaming for what you get. So go click on the link on screen or in the description to get $20 off an annual subscription to Nebula and watch my next video on Paris. It's there right now.